So Malachi is kind of like my psychotic, doomed prophet, <laughs> who is my um, kind of the book is kind of a grotesque homage to Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. So there's you know the Septimus Smith madman character, who's not who's not really mad. He's not any madder than Maggie or Mommy anyway. <laughs> Malachi. They pretend not to see him. He stands at the mouth of the highway and they roar past him in their metal cages. These metal cages that keep out the outside world, the unpleasant reality. They do not see him. They choose not to see him. His inconvenient prophecies. They are willfully blind. They do not care about being saved. They do not want to know how they are hurrying towards the end, the end that is near in their metal cages, their oil-guzzling monster trucks their battle tanks that devour up the lives of innocence. How, how can they not see what is there? How can they ignore what is in front of their faces? The sun, the sun, it speaks to him. He holds his face towards it. These people, yes, they are all prisoners, prisoners of their thoughts, their minds like small cages. They do not want to hear the truth. They are deaf and dumb to the truth. Small towns, small minds, middle class, middle of the world, middle, meddled, muddled. He holds up signs of elegant simplicity. Today's sign was instructed to him from on high. The men that lead you are evil. Do not go like flocks of sheep. He holds the sign up to the battery, chasing each other down the blazing concrete, like dogs chasing their tails, a barren landscape. The men that lead you are evil. Do not go like flocks of sheep. It is a simple sign, but they do not look him in the eyes. No, the eyes that know, the mouth that speaks truth. The men that lead you are evil. Do not go like flocks of sheep. They can be led like sheep by the butcher men, the butcher men that have slaughtered leagues of innocence. For what? For the black gold that powers the monsters, he watches chase each other, a dizzying blur. Rush hour. Everything is a rush. Everything is fast, fast, fast. They slow down for no man. Dark speed monsters that are the signing bonus of a pact with the red-faced devil. He of horns. He in disguise. He allowed to live among mortals. He allowed to conduct evil, to murder, to thieve, and to stay on this earth in opulent grandeur. There is no judgment day for the devil while on earth. It is hot today, yes, it is Hades. The end, the end will have the sun setting on the ground, setting the city ablaze with furious fire. And only he, only he will be saved. He and his family, he and his mirror, his Malachi, because he believed because he spread the message, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. He wanders over to the quickie stop. He is hungry. He is thirsty. He wishes for a cup of water, a bit of change. Citizens stagger out from the doors, holding foot-long candy bars like swords, big slurps and satiated expressions. Citizens fed a steady diet of lies, lies, lies. He swallows up the air, the trees, the sun. They will nourish him. He walks past the fill-up station. Words flash before his eyes. A message. He stops and studies it. United States of America, love it or leave it. God bless America. Stop by our convenience store to stock up on snacks. Would you like a receipt? <laughs> Plus, yes or no. Thank you for your visit. I'm going to read one last Maggie. The Maggie sections kind of trip people out, but they're really fun to read for me. Yeah. It's a sadist in me, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Maggie. Maggie likes the bad boys. Yes, Maggie likes the bad men. But why, Maggie, when you have such a nice father? <laughs> Maggie likes the wounded soldiers. She likes the fallen angels. She likes the devil types like her blonde Lucifer. Maggie likes the dark plus handsome, dark plus mysterious, dark plus brooding types. She likes the Marlon Brando types, the James Dean types, 
the Rebels Without a Cause, and she is the nice Natalie Wood who wants to go on the wrong side of the tracks. <laughs> Once Maggie lay down on the tracks, but the train didn't come and she got up again. <laughs> that was attempt number one. Maggie the cat has nine lives. She wishes they would hurry it up already and be done with. If Maggie was a cat, she would be a black cat, and you better not cross her path. Maggie is very deep. She is a deep well. She is a black hole. You cannot look down her, although you can look down her blouse whenever you'd like and tell her she's pretty. Maggie is afraid of falling, but Maggie loves to fall in love. Maggie is always falling in love with unworthy boys who destroy her. Maggie is currently quite sad because she's torn up over a boy. He's torn her to pieces. She keeps on waiting for him to rescue her, and he never comes. She likes the bad boys, the ones that are bad for her. Maggie is self-destructive. She has a love instinct and the death instinct, and they are in an internal cage match inside her head. This latest boy is playing with Maggie's head. Maggie is boy crazy. This boy has made her crazy. He is the cook at the restaurant where she waits tables. He is blonde and devilish and has thin, snowy biceps and reads Nietzsche. He drinks scotch out of the bottle, which he chases with milk because of his ulcer, which because he feels so deeply, he is deeply tormented. He chases his scotch with milk, and Maggie chases him. He is a silent torture type like Marlon Brando with the stringy blonde hair and overcoat in Last Tango in Paris. Maggie likes the silent brooding type. She is so desperately in love with this boy. She is so honestly, truthfully, agonizingly head over her heels in love. He doesn't say much about the subject. Maggie consults the Daisy as Oracle. He loves her. He loves her not, but secretly she hopes he loves her. He doesn't want to get involved, but he lets her give him a blowjob over by the meat cooler. He can't get too close to people, but he lets her come over, just this once, and he fucks her without a condom. Maggie doesn't know how to say no, and then refuses to hold her. She beats at the wall of his hollow frame, say something, say something, damn it. Her blonde devil cook has a terrible temper. He is like the abusive father she always dreamed of having. <laughs> he once even put his fist through a wall over some girl he was in love with. But not over Maggie, because he doesn't think of her that way. Oh, Maggie dreams that someday her Marlon Brando will grow to love her in that way that he will tell her what to wear and who to see and put his fist through walls and jealous rages over her. Maggie wants nothing more than to be slapped around a little. She wants to be punished. She wants to be punished for her bad, bad soul. This the boy obliges in bed, and that's why she can't forget him. They can cop fairy tales where he is driven far out into the woods and has tied her up, and gagged her, and beaten her senseless, and Maggie shivers because she can only imagine the depths of such love. But Marlon Brando has now run away with Maggie's best friend, and Maggie is crazed with grief. She writes some little notes, but she receives no answer. She leaves desperate cries for help on his voicemail, but he does not return her calls. He has left her with nothing but his memory, and that inconvenient case of gentle to warts. Maggie just wants to die. She just wants to be put out of her misery. She must get a job at a new restaurant, one of those chains where she has to wear a tie and mention two appetizers by name upon greeting, because she cannot bear seeing the boy anymore. Although sometimes she walks by his apartment building, hoping to see him still. And with time plus distance, perhaps this great love will dissipate, and she will forget. She will sink into a hopeful amnesia. But did Romeo forget Juliet? No, he did not. And anyway, the first cut is the deepest. Okay. Well, thank you for coming tonight. No, I think thank it's you. Cool.